Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, this feels very familiar. I've been uh, running BOFs for quite some time. I think I know a, a number of you here. I see the peanut gallery forming up here in the front. <laughs> Tim gets his own microphone. <laughs> oh, very cool. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to just uh, launch in and talk a little bit about Risk Five and Rise for anybody who is not familiar. Anybody familiar with Risk Five? I think probably everybody in the room. Anybody familiar with Rise? Only a few. Okay. Well then, good. I actually do have something substantial to share. So uh, Risk Five. We use Risk Five. Uh, just so everybody knows, my name is Jeff Rowe. Uh, I've been in open source circles for a little while. And uh, for the uh, last three years, I've been at Red Hat. But for the two years before that, I, uh, I was a program manager for RISC-V International and uh, helped, uh, helped uh, convert it from RISC-V Foundation to RISC-V International. It was an extremely fun project and uh, continues to be a fun project that, um, that we are actually addressing now from uh, Red Hat as well. So hopefully I'll be able to cover a little bit of that. What do we mean when we talk about RISC-V? Uh, we use the one name to mean many things. Uh, it's an open instruction set architecture primarily. Uh, RISC-V uh, came from UC Berkeley in about 2010. I think it was when it was first published and uh, formed as a foundation, an open source foundation in 2015. Uh, in 2019, uh, it, the foundation um, was restructured and moved underneath the Linux Foundation as a contracted uh, project. And uh, over the course of the next two years, uh, we increased the staff from two to 15. We increased the, uh, the, the membership substantially. And since then, uh, after building up a, a large technical organization underneath that was, that was much, much better organized than previously, uh, we have now passed, I think, 52 extensions into the original ISA. So that is an, that is an exceptional, exceptional uh, accomplishment. Uh, which I can take no credit, but I am I'm very, very pleased that it has happened and that uh, RISC-V is emerging as the standard that it is. Uh, RISC-V, of course, uh, can support both open and proprietary cores. Uh, the core of, is just the expression of the ISA. The ISA remains open, even though it does support uh, proprietary cores as well. Uh, there are a number of open and proprietary cores out on the marketplace right now. Uh, and a number of groups that are forming to create both kinds. Um, there is a software ecosystem supporting these cores. Uh, it is somewhat behind the times a little bit, and um, that is actually going to be the purpose of RISE, which we'll talk about in a few seconds. Um, there is a, certainly a business ecosystem in developing, promoting, and promoting RISC-V. Uh, the RISC-V international membership spans uh, globally across 70 countries at least. Uh, and it's roughly one-third in North America, one-third in Asia, and one-third in, um, in Europe. And uh, I believe there are up to 3,000 members now. So that includes, that includes uh, inter individual members as well. So of corporate members, I believe there are roughly 750. So it's a, it is a very big and vibrant ecosystem, and it is uh, very important for an open source ecosystem that it be multiple voices. And so by that measure, uh, we feel that RISC-V is extremely healthy. Uh, there is an extensive community surrounding the RISC-V architecture that has nothing to do with corporate America. Um, certainly the, the original RISC-V mailing lists uh, are still around as Google Groups. Uh, they're still very active. And uh, there are many other communities supporting the RISC-V ecosystem, which we'll get into here in just a second. From a hardware ecosystem perspective, um, there are some really interesting projects. Chips Alliance through the Linux Foundation is one. It is a, a, a group of companies that are collaborating on, on creating SOC designs. Uh, Beagleboard.org has just announced, I think, their second or third uh, Beagle, Beagle, Beagle V. Uh, RISC-V based Beagle board. And then the Open Hardware Group is a, a, a very interesting organization uh, underneath the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, Open Hardware Group is a collection of SOC designers who get together and create SOCs based on open cores. And so, and the result is also open source. So what you end up with is a full-fledged SOC design that is open all the way down to the transistors. 
Uh, some of these are actually uh, burned in silicon. A lot of them are available as FPGA cores or as uh, in, in chemo. And um, they are a great representation of the, uh, the RISC-V community. Uh, I added a few names here just to show which hardware providers are out there. This is by no means a complete list, and anybody's inclusion or exclusion on this list should not indicate any kind of a preference because there are many companies out there even that are exploring RISC-V that we never hear about within the community. Uh, and they include hardware providers, service providers, systems integrators, software providers like Red Hat, which we'll cover in the next slide. And also a lot of academic and labs, academic institutions and labs. Uh, UC Berkeley is still very much involved. Um, the Chinese Academy of Sciences is quite involved. Uh, MIT and their, uh, the CSAIL group has been uh, a member since the very beginning. Uh, ETH Zurich is, one of the, is a university that is one of the providers of those open cores that are so popular. And then uh, Rios Labs is actually a, a lab in China that was created in order to support the RISC-V ecosystem in China from a hardware perspective. And uh, they all provide open, open cores. Uh, I believe also, if I remember correctly, that RISC-V was recently chosen as the National Instruction Set Architecture of Pakistan, which sounds kind of odd, but when you think about it, that means that you know, in today's world where uh, sovereignty is actually you know, a, an important issue from the, from the point of view of intellectual property, that makes perfect sense for a, a country like Pakistan. They also have been very active in the, in the community within uh, RISC-V International. So the software ecosystem is more my playing field. Uh, the, um, this includes operating systems, firmware, development tools, libraries, etc. And uh, there are a number of, uh, of large distros now that support RISC-V, including FreeBSD, including Zephyr, uh, including Linux, of course. Uh, many, many distros under Linux, uh, including Fedora, Ubuntu, SUSE, etc. Um, there are some gaps that, we, that have been identified. And uh, there was a group recently that has formed called the RISE Project. Uh, in fact, we're celebrating our first anniversary in about a month. Uh, RISE is short for RISC-V Software Ecosystem. And it is a, a group of about 20 member organizations whose goal is to provide support for the RISC-V Software Ecosystem. And that includes both engineering support, because each one of those, or, or those members provides a, an engineer into the TSC, uh, as well as financial support. Um, the, uh, we, the, the project collects dues, and then our biggest line item in the budget is to push that money back out into the ecosystem. And uh, there's uh, a little bit over 700,000 euros, I believe, currently dedicated to open projects. Uh, and these are, um, there is a process, an RFP process, that is uh, outlined on the wiki uh, that anybody can, can follow. And um, it's value, these, uh, the, the requests are evaluated underneath the TSC, generally under the working groups that are outlined here. Or if something comes up that isn't part of these working groups, then of course that's also evaluated at the top level. And um, we're very happy that this is continuing to be prosperous. And uh, we're hoping for more membership. So if your organization feels like spending some money on the RISC-V software ecosystem, we feel that this is a good way to do it. The most important thing about RISE is that none of the work is actually held within RISE. Uh, RISE does not create any projects. We always work upstream because upstream is where the action is. And uh, we would not be supporting the, co the community unless we were actually working upstream. So that is a uh, basic introduction to the kind of RISC-V world. And uh, at this point, I would just like to open it up um, to anybody who has things that they would like to talk about with regard to risk five. This is a boff, a birds of the feather talk, which means that we all get to chat rather than just uh, have me talk on because everybody will go to sleep if that happens. Anybody have anything to say? Oh, one second. We have just one, one thing also to mention. I believe we have uh, people streaming and watching, so let's make sure to talk into the microphone so people. Oh, can hear. okay. I'm sorry. No worries. Yeah, you have uh, Ethernet controller on the chip. 
It depends on which chip it is. That would be oh. that would be dependent on the hardware manufacturer who's designing the process, the SOC or the chip or the or the system. So, at this point, do you have any AI uh, in the plan for risk? There, it's interesting you should mention that actually. Uh, risk five um, has been be, has been used in a number of uh, AI accelerators that are actually currently on the market. Um, uh, what they're finding is that it's it if, even for a, a large scale design, it is uh, it is very effective to use something like Risk Five to create accelerators because it's a completely open ISA. It's very flexible. It scales from, you know, a tiny chiplet all the way up to uh, an HPC, sixty four bit machine, and um, there's a lot of opportunity there. Jeffro, could you jump back one slide? Certainly. And uh, I'll put you on the spot. And the work groups under RISE are doing some amazing work. Could you give us flavor? I mean, as obviously a lot of details on the wiki. Give yes. us a flavor of the nine and what's being what's going on upstream. Oh, uh, flavor of what's going on upstream currently is going to possibly be outside my scope. But I can tell you exactly where to find it. <laughs> All of the work that each of these groups does is outlined on the wiki. And we also give talks at the Risk Five summits every six months or so. There's, uh, there's one coming up in Europe in June in uh, Munich, I believe. And uh, there will be another one in the fall in the Bay Area in Santa Clara in October. So I encourage you all to, to uh, chime in on those. And all, they're usually all uh, recorded, too, so the recordings will be out there. The most recent one will be out there. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. So uh, if we look at the members of RISE project, there are a lot of big companies. And so looking at what is being done based on the uh, Wikipedia and uh, meeting minutes and everything, so it's primarily focused around uh, kind of a data center solutions. Is that correct? I don't think that that would be necessarily intentional. I think that's probably what is, I'm sorry, am I right here? I don't think it would be intentional to be focused on data center. Data center is one of the focus areas, certainly, but there are also uh, members there who are interested in other aspects, uh, certainly embedded, uh, automotive. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the members right now currently. Uh, we could just bring it up, actually. No, no, I'm not arguing that there are members who are interested in other aspects or other areas. The question is uh, how that work is being prioritized. Like it is just a vote and uh, more more members want to do uh, like, I don't know, server kind of things. And so uh, that's why all the resources which are dedicated or were contributed to the projects are being spent on that area. I mean, I'm a little bit concerned. So how can uh, other uh, areas also benefit from that? Because otherwise, so the, the thing is, uh, so if some company joins RISE and expects mm -hmm. to get some benefit from that, not only contributes resources, right? Everybody wants to get something. How uh, can that company make sure that it will get something of their interest, but not only something for others? Uh, certainly, if there's something of general interest, uh, it would be discussed in the TSC. All of the decisions for the work that is being done come from the, the, uh, the Technical Steering Committee. And uh, that is, there is a member of every single member, every single member within RISE has a, a membership in the Technical Steering Committee. And um, I'm not sure that that answers your question, though. Oh, well, I think primarily, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we heard earlier in a different talk that um, Yocto is one of the distribution or build system that does not support Risk Five yet. Do you see this as a, is that one of the projects that Rise will take on, or do you want are, to answer? Are, are there any Yocto folks in the room that could speak to that? Don't give Philip a microphone. Okay. I am very glad. <laughs> I'm very glad you asked this question. I'm going to be as diplomatic as possible. So, um, first of all, there's a lot of MCU class uh, CPUs and things that are out there, right? So this is not Linux capable, but we've seen um, quite a few Linux capable boards out there. And everybody's asking Yocto Project when you're going to have this officially supported. So during the final feature freeze of the Scarth Gap release, which is coming out this month, we had QMU RISC-V B 
being tested on the auto builder. We reached out to multiple community folks in the Risk Five community, and not one person, not one entity stepped up to actually join Yachter Project as a member because we need somebody at the Platinum membership mm -hmm. to make that an officially supported reference platform. So no one stepped up to fund that. And we got actually a much worse response from an organization that is on the screen. And I'm not going to go any further because it will get political. So if you want the Octo Project to have Risk Five support, we need you to approach whoever makes these decisions to actually get a platinum membership in Yocto Project, or else you will never ever have it in Yocto Project because we can't do the work for free. It has to be funded by a platinum member, period. I would add that it's not just software work that needs to be done. There's infrastructure work there as well that actually does cost hard dollars. And so it's not been an, an easy problem. Um, from the work that I've done on the Octo Project, it has been difficult sometimes to create support for specific platforms simply because nobody wants to enable software for their competitors. So that's one of the reasons why Yocto has been so popular is because it, it puts that into a neutral place. And we feel that RISE can do something similar to that. So the question I heard you ask was, is RISE planning on supporting Risk Five within Yocto? And uh, I can't give it a, a yes or no because those, dis those discussions have not ended yet, but they are certainly ongoing. And Yocto is a very important part of the, I want to say compilers and tool chains, as well as the developer infrastructure working groups. So yeah, those discussions are definitely ongoing. And I have my fingers crossed because I have a vested interest in both projects. So the fact that um, like Meta Risk Five exists, does that and it functions fairly well? Does that discourage that kind of um, actual pay-to-play? Okay. So what do we need in order to have this <laughs> actually be supported in Yocto Project? Okay. We actually need it to be constantly tested on the auto builder every single day. That means that we do it as QMU Risk Five. QME Risk 564. So we enabled that, we tested it, we proved it works, so and nobody, I know, but it, it is, it, okay, yes, it's there, it's, yes, it's supported, okay, it, by other community layers, but there's still a fundamental gap right now because it can't be officially supported by the project unless we have it in core. Right. My, my question is more of the, why, why is that, that there essentially existing? Does that discourage somebody to say, because they're, they're looking and say it works, so why am I, right. why do I need to, to jump in and, and hey, it may work, but as long as it, it, it yep. can be Okay, yeah, so, all right, so, you know, perhaps, I, I don't know, I, I'm gonna let Philip handle that one, sorry. I'm, pr I'm probably already not saying the right thing. <laughs> so it, it's complicated. Um, the answer to your question is you can sit there and you can build a Kimu image for Risk Five, and it basically works. I mean, I did this to show that I could run GNU Radio on Risk Five um, one or two years ago. It basically works. The problem is that if we turn it on as an officially supported thing, it runs through the auto builder tests, and if we have bugs show up, we don't really have anyone in a position to address the bugs and we'll block builds. So, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to make sure that we understand the underlying problem is we don't want to block builds without having people signed up to make sure we have the resources to fix them. Yep, it is strictly a resource problem. I would say to answer your question about does having a working meta risk five discourage that kind of investment, I would say that, I would say no. Because um, I, I think that companies are smart enough to see that a proof of concept exists and it doesn't necessarily create a, a working project. So um, 
And it doesn't, and it certainly precludes things like testing and support, as Philip mentioned. And when the um, when the first Beagle Five uh, uh, development boards came out, I was one of the people that had that, and I absolutely can tell you, yeah, hundred percent, it worked, right? So we proved it with Buildroot, we proved it with Yacht, uh, the YOE distro, which is Yocto based. I proved it with ISAR also because that was a place that we hadn't done it yet. And so we absolutely have, you know, all of the, all of the tooling and everything ready to have this be supported. Um, it's, we're just missing a few other aspects of it. And I think the resourcing, so you have to itself is already, you know, we're, we got some resourcing issues already as is. And so this is just an area where we have to make sure the resourcing happens before we can actually officially accept it as being supported. One thing I can say as a, a semi-official representative of RISE is that having this conversation in this room is going to help the situation significantly. I can take this back into the TSC and the RISE board and make a case for Yocto support. So thank you all for bringing up a, a possibly controversial subject. Because ultimately the vendors need to hear from you that you want it, right? Yes, this exactly. Is really, this is actually the message. Yep. The law of supply and demand requires a supply and a, and a demand. So does anybody want to talk about anything else? <laughs> oh, one right there. So I uh, <clears throat> just want to start out, I'm not trying to salt the wound, but I caught uh, Linus this morning at, I think I got in around like 9.07 um, in his keynote speech. Um, and all I caught was he was just mentioning how he is pretty convinced that Risk Five is going to quote, make all the same mistakes that x86 and all these other ISAs did. Um, so as someone who only really has like a service level understanding of these different instruction sets, um, can you give me your kind of take on that and, and why risk might be able to avoid those kind of things um, and, and what those silly mistakes that he mentioned might be? That's a really good, that's a really good question, honestly. Kim, do you want to take this one? All right. Braver the man than I. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think, um, you know, Everybody's um, open to their opinions, right? And you probably expect something, so you should take it that way. Essentially, what you look at is the way, if you look at how the hardware group is functioning today, right? So there are a lot of extensions being pro proposed. They are being discussed, ratified, right? And then if you look at the vector extension took so long, right? That at one point of time, it looked like, will it happen or not? And then, you know, there was a previous version and the next version came along. So what happens is, um, as you vet it more, right? So you are, uh, suppose, I mean, you will naturally make less mistakes. As humans, we make mistakes, you know. Uh, whether we will make same mistakes again, that will be a little bit foolish. But if we make mistakes, I mean, chance of us making mistakes are a bit less, right? And there is more feedback you get from different people. So my hope is, and that's my hope, that you know you will come out with probably something that will have uh, addressed some of it, but not all of it. So, um, and I think the extension groups are like exactly working in that fashion, where you know it goes out for review, and everybody is open to provide their feedback. You know, so you are not looking for like one silicon vendor or somebody to come up with like your next generation of vector extensions or some other stuff. So in that way you know, you can involve a lot more ideas, right? Whether all of them get implemented, maybe not. So that's a new way of doing things. I don't know how it's gonna pan. And I would say that as some of the SOCs come out that you have a problem with the, still have the vendor kernel tree problem. We're not seeing it necessarily hitting mainline immediately. There's one more up here and then I'll come back to you. So this started out of Berkeley. Do you, do you, do you have any information on other universities or schools that are pushing this as part of their program now? Uh, there's a huge list on the risk. If you look under the risk five members list, you'll see uh, particularly down toward the bottom, there is a humongous stack of, of logos. And there's the university program 
as well. So I think there's, a, there's a university program. As well. Yeah, so you can connect to Risk Five Foundation, and I think they have specific programs for University Connect. Yeah. They're here at the conference too. There's a booth in the back. Yeah, they have a booth. Oh, okay. So I actually wanted to answer the previous question. Okay. Uh, and so I think Linus actually uh, meant something like that. So uh, we are here. Uh, we look at that as specifications, as a software people uh, doing something. But uh, what are we talking about? These extensions and everything. This is only uh, these are only specifications, right? But implementation is a different thing, and it's not that those uh, vulnerabilities which uh, we were talking about, Linus was talking about, they came out about uh, due to the wrong specifications. Now quite in reverse, as Linus mentioned, it is all about all microarchitectural tricks which you do to imp increase your performance. And these things are being done by uh, completely different people. Moreover, still, even if we are talking about Risk Five, most of implementations they are proprietary, and uh, these are big teams working. And so, look at all of these companies which we had on the previous slide. All of them they do proprietary implementations, and uh, you won't be able to look at them and improve them or even review. And uh, because still they want to have uh, a lot of performance out of their silicon, they will still do most of the th same tricks. And I'd say that there is state of the art uh, in that area, right? So everybody does. So if you want to be very performant, you will do uh, out of order, you will do caches, you will do everything. And so side attacks, as Linus mentions, uh, they are uh, smartly used, smartly, like in the wrong way, mm -hmm. used uh, to abuse your implementation. So it, it won't go anywhere, regardless what kind of specifications will be written. And that's why, yeah, we need to educate uh, hardware folks, uh, possibly we need to implement some tools which will try to stress this like we do with software. So there are tools which do fuzzing of something. So maybe something like that is possible for hardware development. But specification itself and uh, software community cannot actually affect that much. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we, we basically are looking for also like new ideas in there, right? So if you look at some of the companies who are new in this market, right, they have new tools. And they do things differently. And um, they have like new design tools. So, you know, yeah, I mean, we will mis make same mistakes if we put this thing into same processes. But I think the open nature of it kind of makes it possible that there will be newer ideas from like ground up. They will build things. And that, that might be, uh, you know, the forcing function, for so to speak, that will make it do things indifferently. But you are absolutely right about like, um, you know, there are other things besides ISA which define those errors, and they will still continue if we keep doing that way. So, yeah, so RISC V won't help in that regard. I would say that there is a possibility to build on the knowledge that has already existed in the world. I mean, Intel has been around since 1968. They, they, built a lot of the, the of problematic stuff into the system and have also fixed a lot of the problematic stuff in the system. ARM has trodden a different path. But uh, I think what Linus was referring to was the, uh, I think that chaos is an appropriate word, of the chaos that was, the, was uh, ARM hardware enablement in the late 90s in the Linux kernel. It was kind of the Wild West. And I will definitely give a call out, and it's not just because the CTO is in the room, but I will give a call out to Lenaro for solving that problem. And so the risk 5 for one thing, also, markets are stupid. They don't necessarily have immediate guiding functions. There, there's no central intelligence there. So, um, you know, the ARM market may have made, made, uh, con made some confusion and chaos. But or organizations like Lenaro, which is an open organization, are the ones that have been able to solve that. And so I believe that the risk 5 stupid market can also follow some of those same paths and make completely different mistakes. They will make mistakes, and they might make very smarter. They might make smarter mistakes, or they might even make dumber mistakes. They won't be the same, but uh, we at least have the 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 uh, the legacy of success to follow. That that ARM didn't have before, and that Intel didn't have before that. So, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. Um, anybody want to broach a new subject? So. <clears throat> Let's say I'm trying to make the justification to my company that we, you know, we want to start using Risk Five, mm -hmm. right? Um, what 
besides like the open nature of the platform, what are the marketing points, you know, that I can convince the company that we should take on the risk of using this new platform that may not have tooling fully established for it, you know, can't build it in Yocto quite yet. Well, I guess unless you use a metal layer. Um, well, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. That's a, that's a good question. And um, given that I never actually worked in RISC-V marketing, I'm not sure that I have quite the right answer. Um, do you want to take a crack at it? All right. Stefano Setole, everyone. <laughs> not that I worked in marketing, but I'm happy to answer. Uh, so it depends, uh, depends on the company's use case, first off. Uh, so uh, what does your company in particular do? Like, would you be buying the SOC or would you be creating the SOC? Buying it. Buying the SOC, okay. So that's probably the most common use case. And I think <clears throat> that is going to be one of the tougher sells. Um, so if you look at the marketplace right now, there's not going to be a ton of vendors you can go to to buy off-the-shelf SOCs. Um, I, when I worked at risk Five International and people would come to me and say, hey, we're looking to uh, build our own, there was a lot of options. When people were coming to me saying, hey, who is selling, that got much more difficult. But let's assume that that market uh, fixes itself in the next five years. Uh, why would you use that? Well, I mean, I could certainly hand off to those companies to explain to you why you should buy from them. But as you know, a former engineer and as someone trying to think outside the box in terms of how to build products, Risk Five is going to offer opportunities that other architectures are not. Um, specifically, if you look at it compared to uh, either ARM or my new company, x86 and Intel, uh, Risk Five is going to be able to put stuff out there that Intel as a company is not going to want that market. They're going to look at it and say, nope, the thing you're doing, duct taping the vector spec to this other thing that you're doing, that doesn't, it, there's not numbers there that Intel cares about. So Risk Five will serve that market. And what's likely to happen is that the software infrastructure built up behind that concept will be much stronger because you've got a company that's trying to change the way things are done in that particular way. So, I mean, I haven't asked, addressed your question about the risk, no pun intended, and what you're trying to do. I think that's going to be there, but risk is inherent in innovation. If the company wants to try something new and do something interesting, there's going to be risk. And so the, the question is whether or not the concept is vetted by enough customer reaction. You know, when you test, when you pilot that concept, is risk solving that problem in a different way? But to answer your initial question, it's that the Risk v chip will solve a different problem, one that, you know, NXP, Qualcomm, and Intel aren't willing to do because the numbers aren't big enough or because it's an untried market. And that's likely what you're going to end up doing. Does that, does that answer part of your question? Yeah, it does. Thank okay. you very much. Excellent. I think we have time for one more topic if anybody wants to bring one up. We have put everybody to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I just mentioned this in the, the talk in the ballroom. Uh, Risk Five, I think, should create something similar to like uh, Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. a simple board module and simple maybe yet for something that people can use and just take home, plug in the computer, try it out, see the architecture, see the instruction set, and, and that way you can suck the people in to try it, mm -hmm. and then maybe they can find out something like we just said earlier about, about mistakes and things like that. Uh, but I, I doubt it because I, 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 for me, for the first look, I think it's pretty solid. Anyway, yeah. So I think that's my suggestion. I just repeated what I said earlier. Yes. <laughs> kind of for yes. And, and there are a number of development boards like that out there. And I will give a shout out to the Beagle Board folks. <laughs> oh, and here's one right here. <laughs> Would you like to say a few words, sir? <laughs> Actually, the guy from BeagleBoard just gave me the board. Oh, OK. <laughs> so th which one is this? This is the Beagle via head. Yeah. Yes, that, one is, that is running a RISC-V processor. Uh, I believe that's the second one that's come out, and um, that's the second one, and then there's the Polar uh, Polar Fire, which is the Beagle Five Fire, I think is what it's called. Okay, okay. What's that? Icicle. Icicle. Yeah, Icicle? Okay. Anyway, it's um, you know an FPGA. Uh, ah. Yeah, it's a hard. Yeah. Anyway, it it's another. There's there's three. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So there are um, there are definitely options out there. And so, like, I know you know me personally. Like, I'm just kind of waiting for the developer workstation so I can actually do stuff native, which is, you know, add a 
a kind of a level of performance that's mm -hmm. you know sort of there. There are some of those out there. Um, yes, so that's there's, the, there's the, the Milk Five Pioneer as well, and that's like that's fairly new still, right? To me, anyway. They're yeah. very new. Yeah, because um, anyway, so like that's kind of one of the things like I was looking for, right? And so um, there's a lot, so there's a ton of excitement, right? Yes. And we talk about this in the the when you talk about it from the Yachter Project community or the open embedded community or just the embedded community in general, we are all super excited. We're like really want like when's the next SOC coming out? What is it going to be? What is it? Is it on a board? Can I buy it? Can I buy it now? You know, like that's how we all are all the time, right? And I mean, I personally own quite a few of these. I think I just ordered the Milk Five, so yes, yeah. Okay. Well, I. I'm not totally certain at the time, but it is 535, and I believe that we are ending at 535. Is that right? Yeah. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, definitely go take a, take a look at the Talk to Risk 5 up in the booth area. Uh, if you want to talk about RISE, I will be in the Red Hat booth for the rest of the conference, and I hope you all have a good time. Take care.